years ago. I reached a point in those weeks where the stench of sin and death and hell so filled my nostrils, so close to the chasm of this life and the next. And at that point, I knew assuredly God's word is true. His death for me does make a difference. And that Jesus Christ walks with me in the valley of the shadow of death. And that I will live with my Lord Jesus forever. I was holding on to the very hem of the garment of my Lord, white-knuckled at times, but deepened and strengthened in my trust in him. Because Jesus Christ has conquered death and hell. Now some of you may not be able to relate to illness or may not be able to relate to the death of a loved one but I am sure you will relate to my third thorny experience. It's that of a broken heart, a broken relationship. As I said, I'm single, never married and would love to be married to the man of God's choosing. But for whatever reason that hasn't been a part of my journey to this point. But a few years ago, I developed a loving relationship with a man who I hoped, believed, and prayed would one day marry me. But after a meeting a woman on a plane ride and several dinners together, he chose to painfully discard our relationship in favor of the other woman. In all of the physical pain that I have experienced in these past years, nothing, absolutely nothing, has compared to the gut-wrenching pain of a heart ripped apart. I didn't understand what was happening. I didn't know why I was being rejected. And I sobbed and wailed in unutterable anguish, trying to find a meaning. And I'm sure there are women here tonight who have sobbed the tears of a broken heart, a spouse of many years who's been unfaithful, or perhaps left you for another woman. A mother who wants to give love to a child who rejects that love. A fiancé whose engagement is broken off. Or just a broken friendship that's just not where it should be. I empathize with your pain. I wish I could reach out and hold you while you too sob. A broken heart is the result of a broken relationship. It's the result of love extended but not received and often painfully rejected. For me, this wound still remains and I don't think the pain will ever completely go. But what have I learned in and through this thorny experience? The first thing is that forgiveness is a beautiful and a necessary thing. When through God's grace... I was able to reach the point to fully forgive this man. It was then that my love grew even stronger and I was able to be freed up to move on in God's strength. The process didn't happen quickly. It took many months for me to reach that point. But what relief to get to that milestone of forgiveness. Love longs for a response. It longs for some sort of reciprocal love but it can't demand it. I still love this man deeply and I pray for his best good daily and I long to see his life surrendered to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. But these things are outside of my control. I'm responsible only for how I love. Again, I go back to a quote from Larry Crabb. I think he's written some of the most profound books on relationships that I have ever read. This is from a book called Inside Out. We have all been sinned against. We all sin. You have failed to love me as you should, and I have failed to love you. Your failure to love me is painful, sometimes profoundly disappointing, but the Lord's love for me is perfect. Although his his love does not remove the sting of your failure, it gives me all I need to stand as a whole person, capable of loving you regardless of the threat of your further failure. And that is my responsibility, to love you. My love for you, not yours for me, determines in large measure my experience of joy and my sense of intactness. I can love because I am loved perfectly and fully by God. 
and my love for you matters. It can draw you to Christ. It gives my life power and value in his plan. It brings glory to God. And as I falteringly learn to love you without self-protection, I edge toward the longed-for reality of abundant living. Facing our fears is also very important. I felt bound in chains by this other woman. I felt like she had invaded my life. Satan used this woman to taunt me into believing in my own insignificance. But by God's grace, I faced those fears and found relief in him. God's timing, God's choice, God's plan for my life is always best. I had manipulated the situation. I had assumed things that were not to be. And I let my emotions go further down a road than I should have. But there's another broken relationship I must tell you about tonight. It's the broken relationship that you and I have with a holy God. We are born in sin, in our own rebellious ways. And I've come to realize that every sin that we commit results in a broken relationship, not only with God, but usually with people around us. Jesus came to heal broken relationships. He came to restore a unity between him and us. As we think about our own thorns and the painful things that we have gone through, we'd be remiss if we did not consider the pain that Jesus Christ endured for each one of us. Sometimes I have read this next quote, and sometimes I've left it out because it's rather a long quote, but I had a friend of mine who I spoke to on the phone today, and she knew that I was speaking to tonight, and one of the key things she said is, are you going to use that quote? So for her and for you, I'm going to read the long quote. It's from a book called When God Weeps, by Johnny Erickson Tada and Steve Estes. It is probably the most poignant piece of writing I have ever read about the pain that Jesus Christ endured for me and for you on the cross of Calvary. The thorns that God had sent to curse the earth's rebellion now twisted around his brow. His back, buttocks, and the rear of his legs felt the whip. Soon they looked like the plowed Judean fields outside the city. On with the blindfold, someone shouts. That's it, now spin him. Who hit you? (laughs) By the time the spitting is through, more saliva is on him than in him. No longer can he be recognized. Cut him down from the post. Send him toting his crossbar to the playground. Up Skull Hill to the welcome of other poorly paid legionnaires enjoying themselves. On your back with you. One raises a mallet to sink in the spike. But the soldier's heart must continue pumping as he readies the prisoner's wrist. Someone must sustain the soldier's life minute by minute, for no man has the power on his own. Who supplies breath to his lungs? Who gives energy to his cells? Who holds his molecules together? Only by the sun do all things hold together. The victim wills that the soldier live on. He grants the warrior's continued existence. The man swings. As the man swings, the son recalls how he and the father first designed the medial nerve of the human forearm, the sensations it would be capable of. The design proves flawless. The nerve performs exquisitely. Up you go. They lift the cross. God is on display and can scarcely breathe. But these pains are a mere warm-up to his other and growing dread. He begins to feel a foreign sensation. Somewhere during this day, an unearthly foul odor began to waft, not around his nose, but around his heart. He feels dirty. Human wickedness starts to crawl upon his spotless being, the living excrement from our souls. The apple of his father's eye turns brown with rot. His father! He must face his father like this? From heaven, the father now rouses himself like a lion disturbed, shakes his mane and roars against the shriveling remnant of a man hanging on a cross. Never has the son seen the father look at him so, never felt even the least of his hot breath. But the roar shakes the unseen world and darkens the visible sky. The son does not recognize these eyes. Son of man, why have you behaved so? You have cheated, lusted, stolen, gossiped, murdered, envied, hated, lied. 
You have cursed, robbed, overspent, overeaten, fornicated, disobeyed, embezzled, and blasphemed. Oh, the duties that you have shirked, the children you have abandoned. Who has ever so ignored the poor, so played the coward, so belittled my name? Have you ever held your razor tongue? What a self-righteous, piteous drunk, you who molest young boys, peddle killer drugs, travel in cliques, and mock your parents. Who gave you the boldness to rig elections, foment revolutions, torture animals, and worship demons? Does the list never end? Splitting families, raping virgins, acting smugly, playing the pimp, buying politicians, practicing extortion, filming pornography, accepting bribes. You've burned down buildings, perfected terrorist tactics, founded false religions, traded in slaves, relishing each morsel and bragging about it all. I hate, I loathe these things in you. Disgust for everything about you consumes me. Can you not feel my wrath? The father watches as his, fa- as his heart's treasure, the mirror image of himself, sinks, drowning into raw, liquid sin. Jehovah's stored rage against humankind from every century explodes in a single direction. Father, Father, why have you forsaken me? But heaven stops its ears. The sun stares up at the one who cannot, who will not reach down or reply. Two eternal hearts tear, their intimate relationship shaken to the depths. The Trinity had planned it. The Son endured it. The Spirit enabled him. The Father rejected the Son whom he loved. Jesus, the God-man from Nazareth, perished. The Father accepted his sacrifice for sin and was satisfied. The rescue was accomplished. This is who asks us to trust him when he calls on us to suffer. There are thorns and there are blessings in our lives. Cancer is a big thorn in my life, but the blessings are the grace, the sustaining grace of God, and recognizing that relationships and people are the most important thing. This gives me perspective and this allows me to live in the moment, coming face to face with my own mortality. See, I believe you're not ready to live until you're ready to die, and I am ready to die. Death and grieving are very painful thorns in life, but heaven is a reality. I am assured of my future in Christ. Satan is defeated, and Jesus is my victor. And the dreadful pain of broken relationships, I know that I am loved with an unconditional, selfless love of Jesus. He is the lover of my soul. His will is best for my life, one step at a time. I am only in control and responsible for how I love. I cannot predict, control, or sometimes understand how another loves or moves away from that love. So I've told you tonight about thorns and blessings, but I hope that I have shared mostly with you about the relationship I have with an extraordinary Jesus Christ. You too can have a personal relationship with Jesus. He offers himself completely to you, and all you need to do is acknowledge your sin and accept his gift of forgiveness I'm going to close with a song but before I do I just want to share with you an illustration that ties together something about these broken relationships and how they can be fixed my sister Colette and I took a vacation two or three years ago to the Greek islands it was kind of a treat and we were staying on a little island called Paxos and Paxos is only about six miles by three, and it's got thousands of olive trees and beautiful olive groves to walk around. And it has many footpaths that you can take and walk to the beautiful cliffs that drop down into the beautiful blue sea. And my sister and I did a lot of walking the week that we were on this particular island. And um, I, I have told this story never with my sister present so the embellishments are probably not going to happen because she'll know if I'm telling the truth or not Um, but my sister and I are a little different when we were walking around she's married with two kids and the family were back in England so it was a sister's holiday and many of the the walks that we took took us to these 
very sharp cliffs that dropped into raging waters and I would be the adventurous one that would go to the edge of the cliff and she would be the one holding back more. And there is a particular poster that advertises the beauties of this island and it's a poster of an archway that's of solid rock from the mainland out into the ocean. It's called the Tripitos Arch. And we decided one night that it would be great to go to the Tripitas Arch. Oh, and I must tell you that on the posters, um, this archway that goes across is probably three, four hundred feet above the, the ocean that's crashing below. And it says, only the bravest will cross the arch. And so we decided that we should find the arch and it would be good to go there at sunset and get you know the perfect Kodak moment. So we walked through some beautiful olive groves and as we began to come out of the olive grove, the cliff began to loom ahead of us and the archway began to be seen. And both of us kind of gasped at the depth of the fall to the ocean from the archway. And at first, we both said, we're not crossing that. And as I was sort of sitting around on the rocks, edging my way closer to the end, the path that wound its way down to the arch was right along the cliff edge. And I was trying to get the perfect Kodak moment, but my sister was actually walking ahead of me down this pathway. And I started saying, don't go down there. What am I going to tell David if you fall off the cliff? And all these kinds of things, just trying to hold her back from crossing this archway. And it was a little scary. Um, and I was thinking, if she's going down there, I'm going to have to go down there. And inch by inch, my sister took step after step and was eventually right in the middle of this archway, crossing this huge chasm. So I took pictures to prove that we actually did this. And then eventually she crossed and she was on this massive outcropping of rock that was in the ocean. Now I was faced with a choice. Was I going to be on the mainland and leave her to have be the only one to cross the arch? So uh, I had to kind of do the right thing. So I inched my way down, probably on my rear end, if I remember right, and eventually got onto the archway and too felt the exhilaration of s standing on this massive rock arch looking down at the waves and then going across to this big boulder in the sea. And we just had a wonderful time. I remember singing How Great Thou Art at the top of my vo lungs and the wind blowing our voices away and we watched the sunset and we saw the glorious golden orb just reflecting the light. And it was a beautiful moment. But as I went back to our little villa, I was thinking on what that picture really was a good analogy for. And it was just such a perfect picture of us and God and the chasm of sin that separates us. We want to be across there, but we're not sure how to do it. And we're fearful to take those steps, those steps of faith that say, I believe in who you are, I believe in what you say, and I recognize that I need you, Jesus. But what was beautiful was the pulling, the drawing down, the way the Holy Spirit draws us to that position where we need to make a choice for God. And that's what was happening at the arch. We were being pulled down by the lure of the beauty of it and the desire to cross over. That's what the Holy Spirit does. He tugs at our heart and he brings us to the chasm and he says, you cannot get across that on your own. But there is a way to cross that chasm. Jesus Christ is the arch that crosses that chasm. That's why he spread his hands on a cruel Roman cross 2,000 years ago to bridge that gap from where we are in our humanness to be restored into right relationship with God. The only way to find that fulfillment in life, to find that exuberance, is to accept the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and to cross the arch of Calvary. When you reach the other side, you experience the fullness of God. You see that sun that reflects the light of his character. It's a beautiful picture of what Jesus did for us. I've told you tonight about those thorns and blessings. I've told you about the broken relationships. But how is your relationship with God? It's here. It is the foundation of all other relationships. It is here that our thorns find meaning in life. 
and it's here that the future can be made secure in Jesus now this this whole tapestry tidbits is just such a wonderful opportunity for us to get real I've talked to you about some pretty heavy stuff tonight but life is made up of heavy stuff there is a perpetual ache and we will not fulfill our satisfaction in life now but only in Christ when Sally told me about how this works that a speaker comes along and then hopefully afterwards everyone sits around eating cheesecake, drinking coffee and discussing part of what has been talked about I have prayed for you tonight that you will be vulnerable that you will be willing to risk yourself in discussion around the tables that you're at tonight there's some discussion questions that Sally's going to share with you and I hope that as you mull over some of these questions that God would tug at your heart and that you would find the opportunity to, d- to discuss and maybe find some answers to questions or maybe just find a listening ear but I do pray that we'll have the courage to be real with one another tonight I'm going to close with a song that has become my theme song really written by a friend Kathy Tricoli and it really just sums up sums up me